Good afternoon. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to be our, the host of our speaker today. I'd first like to acknowledge the Storer family for making these wonderful lectures possible. Um, and today we have a special treat, one of my scientific heroes as an immunologist. It's uh, wonderful to have our, our speaker today, who is Rolf Zinkernagel, who is a in Professor Emeritus at the University of Zurich in the Department of Pathology. Uh, he received his MD degree from the University of Basel and then got his PhD degree from the Australian National University. He then joined the John Curtin School of Medicine Medical Research in 1973 where he began his uh, research collaboration as a fellow with Peter Doherty. And they were studying the role of the immune system in protecting against viral infections using the lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus as a model. And their research centered on the role of cytotoxic T cells and how they destroy the invading viruses and infected cells. And as many of you know, uh, Professor Zingonegel and Doherty made one of the fundamental discoveries in immunology, that is that of MHC restriction. The requirement that C CTLs recognize not just the foreign antigen, but the MHC molecules at the same time. It really is one of the most significant discoveries in all of biology and immunology. And they won the Nobel Prize in 1996 for this work, and it had profound implications for vaccines, transplantation, autoimmune diseases, and the list goes on and on. Uh, he subsequently studied the role of the thymus in selecting white blood cells, T cells especially, and maturation. And more recently, uh, he has been studying the coevolution of viruses and their hosts. He has numerous accolades beyond the Nobel Prize. He's a member of the American uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in the United States. He's also a member of the German Academy of Sciences, the Australian Academy of Sciences, and he's a Royal Academy of Medicine in Belgium. And among the, all the other uh, prizes includes the Paul Ehrlich Prize, the Albert Lasker Award, and many, many others. And so. It's my great pleasure and honor to welcome Rolf to our campus and uh, looking forward to his talk. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here and to entertain you on an afternoon at 4 o'clock, fairy tale time. So take everything. Uh-huh. Mic doesn't amplify his voice. No, 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 no. The mic is just for the recording. I oh. see. Okay, then I speak up. Have yeah. To yeah. Okay. So it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about immunology. Now, immunology to many seems to be a very complicated issue and subject. In fact, it is very simple. If there is an antigen, then you usually have to get rid of it because the important antigens are infectious. If you can't get rid of it, you die. If you can't get rid of it completely, then you have a problem because the persistence of the antigen just keeps stimulating the immune system and you end up with what we call immunopathology. So I give you my unbiased view of immunity and I'll do that by you know mixing it with a few fundamental questions of doing I think biomedical science. We of course can either observe a disease or a patient and simply ask, you know, why is something wrong? And the, the other extreme way of doing science that is to beg for the question as Medawar formulated it. That is to construct the question. And you always can construct questions by saying, well, is what is the role of IL-57 on a sunny day 
and the role of interferon on a cloudy day. You always will find an answer that is publishable, but whether it's a reasonable question and whether the answer is reasonable is another thing. So m what we can measure is okay because that is what we can publish, but whether what we measure is really important, we, I think, often don't know. And from that point of view, patients are extremely important because patients always will be honest with you as a treating physician and tell you if it works, it's okay. If it doesn't work, you know, it's not okay. And I think, therefore, the connection of m medicine or physicians with immunology and science in very general terms, I think is extremely important. Now, I will give you my quick and brief summary of what I think the immune system is all about. And we'll talk about specificity as one of the hallmarks of, of what we measure in immunology and immunity. Um, and we'll talk about the role of the localization of an antigen within the entire organism and in particular the importance of so-called secondary or tertiary lymphatic organs and the role of antigen in these organs for an immune response. And then at the end we'll try to um, evaluate the idea of immunological memory and whether this so-called immunological memory has any relevance for protection. Now, you know, if we are really honest, I think we are all built to live for 20 to 25 years. That's all that is needed because that is basically the es essence for the next generation. And all the rest is luxury. <laughs> of course, politically, this may not be quite correct. And me being 70, you know, it's a bit one-sided, you know. <laughs> but still, I think that's because that is, of course, our longevity is, 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 is the problem of all the big world problems. There are simply too many humans. I mean, that's... That's how it is. And of course, our human behavior is largely inadequate. Although, you know, a little bit of alcohol, a little bit of sex and so on, that's what we live for. But I think, you know, in terms, in terms of, of, of life limitations, it's very difficult to get that all on the one hat. And then, of course, also politically incorrect is to state that not all, not all humans are equal certainly not with respect to resistance against infections. So, you know, and that of course brings me to the problem of responsibility versus freedom and all, all these things. I mean, for example, take, you know, how our nowadays society can afford to not use vaccines in a way is, is idiotic. I mean, I can't say differently. So I think we have sort of gone halfway over the hill and I will try to, you know, bring some of these aspect, uh, aspects back into a co-evolutionary co context. So if you look at the problem of infection, and I've just really reduced this to a few very simple sketches, but you can extend what I say to bacterial infections or parasitic infections. I mean, the issue is very simple. A virus infects a cell. It can only replicate within the cell. And there are basically two outcomes. The virus destroys the cells. Those are all the acute, so-called acute cytopathic viruses that basically kill you in five to seven days. And of course, if you get killed before 10 or 12 years, you're out of evolution or co-evolution. So that's why it's extremely important to have a very efficient immune response via mostly antibodies, but also via T cells, uh, 
the cell-mediated part of the immune defense, that has to be prompt and extremely efficient. Now, there are many more infections that behave like this. That is, they do not disturb the physiology of the cell, so there is no cell destruction by the infection. And now you see, immediately see where the problem comes in. Because the immune system, for example, the T cells, cannot really smell the difference between a cytopathic and a non-cytopathic infection. Because the alterations and the, the, let's say, the processing of these viral antigens to be noted by the immune system are identical. So now, in, in the case of a non-cytopathic infection, it's actually the immune response that causes the damage. And this is true for HIV infections, hepatitis B, hepatitis T, uh, uh, C, many other infections. So it's like everything in life. You know, there is no such thing as a free lunch. There's always a cost side. And the co-evolutionary elegance of the solution is as follows. To avoid an immune response against an infection that doesn't need to be you know, eliminated because it doesn't cause a damage, is to jump from a virus-carrying mother who carries the virus to the offspring either before birth or right at birth. There's always a small blood transfusion between mother and offspring. And at that time, the offspring, the newborn, is immunoincompetent. The immune system has no function yet. The same is true for mice. So these viruses actually take exactly that situation where there is no T cell and antibody response. So there is no immunopathology and the next generation carries the virus. So, in a way, the ultimate solution to co-evolution, nobody kills anybody and both sides are happy. And of course, in this case, it's also very clear that if a virus is so successful as to eliminate the species, then of course the virus is gone by itself because it depends on, 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 on the host. So, all of this, to summarize, shows that co-evolution is about balanced situations and the immune system simply is one of the factors. For example, if you don't have interferon, if you can't make interferon, if, if you don't have receptors to bind interferon, you are dead before any of this happens. So these innate so-called natural resistance mechanisms, sort of are 90 or 95 percent of our in resistance against infection. And specific immunity is just sort of a frosting on the cake. But it's very important because otherwise we wouldn't have what we call serotypes. You know, polio serotype 1, 2, 3. So if you are immune against serotype 1, you are still susceptible and get killed by polio too. So there is a, you know, a highly specific role for the specific immune response. Now, just a second general point on this slide. Most infectious, in fact all infectious agents, have one characteristic that distinguishes them from our own cell surface or molecules in, in the blood or in serum. And that is the highly repetitive nature of unique structures on, on the surface. This is true for bacteria, viruses, parasites. There is a multimeric dimension to identical determinants that is in the order of 100 to 1,000 to 10,000. And this repetitive unit type of exterior image to the immune system is key not only to induce B cell responses, but also to actually define the specificity, and I will get to that. Now, a second general aspect of the immune system is 
that it is organized in secondary lymphatic tissues, lymph nodes and the spleen. And these are organized in follicles. Here's just a staining with a antibody against antibodies. And you see that these follicles basically are made up out of a, uh, many B cells and in the middle where the light blue part is, uh, actually T helper cells would sit. So there is this intra intra uh, you know, interesting interaction between these helper A cells and the B cells and it is only this interaction that basically makes a long lasting IgG response. Now, if you look at these interactions, they of course depend on um, so-called cytotoxic killer T cells recognizing some bits of antigen peptides presented by the MHC transmutation antigens class 1, whereas the TCD helper cells see fragments of antigens that had been picked up by the cell, processed in phagolysosomes, and represented on the surface via these MHC class 2 types of antigens in humans. It's HLA, D, R, Q, and so on. Now, T helper cells interact with B cells via recognizing the same MHC class 2 types of molecules presenting the same peptides. And this gives the whole interaction a tight control of the cellular necessity. But besides this, these interactions, it's also the anatomical structure that is exquisitely important for these interactions to happen. So if you have, and there are mutant mice that do not have peripheral lymph nodes, you actually cannot make an immune response. So an antigen in the big toe is ignored by the immune system. It, that antigen doesn't exist. It only exists immunologically if the antigen reaches the draining lymph node. And the draining lymph node, of course, in a mouse takes about one and a half millimeters or two millimeters to reach. In a giraffe, you know, it's two and a half meters from the toe to, to the first lymph node. But this is a tubing system, so it's all very quick because it's fluids, you know, flowing. So the distances are not really important. It's the fact that you reach a organized lymphatic tissue. Now, if you imagine that a virus sits in these compartment here and is non-cytopathic, non-lytic, and there is no T cell immune response, then of course the structure will look like this. But if the same virus reaches these structures in an immunocompetent mouse or human, like an HIV infected patient, where that exactly happens, then you see the cytotoxic T cells actually attack the host's own cells infected with a virus that otherwise wouldn't do any harm. And then what happens is the whole structure simply falls apart. And this is typical for the HIV infection. The secondary lymphatic organs simply decay. And if you now inject a third party independent antigen into such a, a situation here, the antigen has nowhere to go. And therefore, there will be no immune res response. It's as if the lymph node or the spleen wouldn't exist. And that's basically the problem with acquired immunodeficiency by HIV. And this is just to show you that if, if antigen gets into a tertiary or secondary lymphatic tissue, then this antigen actually accumulates in these marginal zone macrophage type of compartments. And if this is gone via this immunopathology, you are immunoincompetent. Um, so immunoprotection and immunopathology are just sort of, you know, giving you a balance of good and bad. Um, and this balance is, of course, very important. So I summarize at this point. If a virus 
is cytopathic, then we call the immune response immunoprotective or immunoprotection. If the virus is non-cytopathic, then we call the immune response and the result immunopathology. If we know the virus, we call it immunopathology. If we do not know the virus, we call it autoimmunity. Now, of course, this is pushing the argument slightly, you know, I admit. But, you know, autoimmunity has this aura of mythology, you know, tolerance. What is tolerance? Tolerance is nothing but an idea. The only thing we can measure about tolerance is no response. And the fact that in autoimmunity we have some responses we don't like, you know, we think, well, it must be, like in the financial world, you know, it must be regulation. But we know how efficient regulation is in the financial world. It, the same is true for immunology. It's simply, you know, it, it's a nice idea, but the translation into actually mechanisms or working processes is just, I think, an illusion. Because you can't do simple experiments to disprove, which would be the most efficient way to go about, let's say, approaching truth. It's simply a nice idea, but like many or most nice ideas, ideas are cheap and they don't help really to explain things. So, regulation and other ideas are okay, but... I don't think they are very helpful. And I think if we would know, you know, what etiologies are behind so-called autoimmunities, then we, A, would have to call them immunopathologies, and we could do something about them. So I'm not saying that 100% of autoimmunities are virally or bacterially or parasitically, you know, induced. But if only 50% of them would be, and we would know about them, we, of course, would be much better off. Now, I would like to talk about specificity. Specificity basically can be translated into an ELISA assay. That's what most people do. You know, you take some antigen, denature it by sticking onto some plastic, and then you see whether your antibody binds to that plastic stuff or not. But that's not really what anybody is interested in. We are interested in mostly in antibodies that protect you from infection, or at least too wide a replication of a infectious agent. So, neutralizing antibodies, as I've stated for these, this is a raptovirus like... Um, like uh, um, uh, rabies, you know, where uh, the envelope is made up of a multimeric identical unit structure, and the, and the neutralizing antibodies actually bind to the tips of these monomeric multimers. It's a bit like, you know, antibodies binding to the tips of your fingers if you put them together. Actually, the dimension of an antibody, you know, dimension is about the same as your finger length vis-à-vis -vis the glycoprotein. And the glycoproteins are so densely packed, like my fingers, that an antibody actually cannot squeeze in between. So, by structural limitations, the only antigens that are accessible on an intact virus same is true for most bacteria and classical parasites, is simply given by, by the, the construction of, of the parasite or the virus. So you make tons and thousands of different antibodies against the rest, but these cannot bind to the intact virus. So that limits immediately what we call specificity, because the only thing that counts is the fingertip in a way. And this is illustrated here in this negative staining, that these antibodies that bind, here, those are neutralized. Now, you know, things sort of 
get questions, which is okay because it's a basis of, of research and science. But, you know, certain things get questions every 50 years. And that tells you, you know, the previous generation, having made that proposal, has died in between. So the next generation simply starts from scratch. And this idea is that there must be broadly neutralizing cross-protective antibodies. So, for example, why have all the predecessors been so stupid as not to invent a vaccine against influenza virus that protects against all the influenza viruses? Why do we have to come up with a new vaccine every year or two years? So let's look for cross-protective, neutralizing antibodies. And this, of course, would then be the target for a universal vaccine. Well, you know, viruses, in quotation marks, are not stupid, in particular influenza viruses, because if such cross-protective, broadly neutralizing antibodies would exist, there would be no recurrent epidemics of influenza virus every year, every second year, every tenth year there's a big one, because these cross-protective antibodies would protect, but they don't. So yes, and I think that's a, a very important take-home lesson, you can measure things that look like cross-protective antibodies because they you know, give you a signal in the assay you use like in influenza hemagglutination inhibition assays. But in vivo, it doesn't work. So, if you want to show cross-protective antibodies, you, of course, take an assay that gives you that result, and you publish it in the Science or Nature, which is okay. But it doesn't help the issue, and it doesn't help the patient. So. Measuring is okay, but it's always good to go back. And of course, the same is true for these anti-HIV, cross-protective, broadly neutralizing antibodies. It's just a lousy assay that gives you that, you know, redate. So, I think if a virus, by mutation, changes the tips of the hemagglutinin or the glucoprotein, then, of course, that is the good, a good indication that that is the key determinant or antigenic site that actually is the binding site for the neutralizing antibodies. And cross-neutralization simply is not, is not part of the game. But if, let's say, 95% of immunology academic immunology, is done with bovine serum albumin or ovalbumin and dinitrophenol groups, you know, then you can't blame most of immunologists not to think of this type of specificity. Because, of course, ovalbumin is very easy to measure in an ELISA. But, it, you know, the LD50 of ovalbumin for a mouse is probably 50 grams. It's not relevant. Okay, now, if that is also, and if the neutralizing antibodies against acute cytopathic infections must be very efficiently induced, that really means this must, these specificity must be part of the B cell repertoire. That is, what is available at day zero. So, Hans-Peter Rosen, uh, a PhD student in the lab, did the following experiment. If you have 100 antigenic sites on an intact virus, it is highly unlikely that if you have one neutralizing antibody that you can compete off any other either polyclonal or monoclonal antibodies. So he made 50 monoclonals and 20 Mon other monoclones, 50 that neutralize the virus and 20 that bind to something else. And then he cross-competed every single one monoclonal against the rest of the monoclones. And he could never, he always cross-competed. He could never find two monoclonals he could bind 
onto one intact virus. So that tells you the antigenic site is rather small because you can't place two neutralizing antibodies independently. And the second assay he did, if that is all so, let's take a polyclonal serum, let's say of a cow. This was a, a rhabdovirus from a cow infection, vesicular stomatitis virus. There are two major serotypes, there are many more, which we use. One is New Jersey, the other is Indiana. So let's take a polyclonal cow serum against a VSV Indiana and try and let's compete with any of the monoclonals against that polyclonal serum. So that's what's shown here. You take the serum staining of either infected cells or uh, viral particles and now you compete with any of the 50 monoclonals and you always reduce that staining down to background. So that tells you the polyclonal serum, the only thing it can recognize on, on an intact infected cells or an intact bowel party is actually what is seen or recognized by the monoclonal antibody, which really reduces the complexities of our thinking about specificity to, to actually a structural limitation that is given. And therefore, the rest of the virus simply can change as much as or as little as it wants. The only thing that has to be changed is that tip of the finger. And that, of course, then would make it relatively easy for some viruses, particularly RNA viruses, to change the serotype. With HIV, the problem is much more serious because there, the variations are not three ser serotypes or five like with these types of rhabdoviruses. It's probably 100,000. Maybe it's a million, we don't know. So there are 100,000 variants in that area. So to make a vaccine that should cover 100,000 variants is simply impossible. Or you have to make a vaccine that combines the 100,000 variants. And that, of course, is not so easy. Okay, so now let's look, again oversimplified, at an acute, in this case like a, a rabies virus infection or influenza or measles, you know, that kills the host in seven days, like Ebola. Ebola is a very easy one. It kills you in seven days and then you are out of coevolution. But if you make neutralizing antibodies, you survive. So, straightforward. So, the virus replicates, you make a T-cell response, you make ELISA measurable antibodies, and you make, with the same kinetics, very early, within day two or three, measurable titers of IgM, neutralizing antibodies. And if you can't make them, you are dead by day seven. Other viruses, like HIV or hepatitis C or hepatitis B, or in the mouse, we use the model virus, lymphocytic or meningitis virus, which is again like HIV or HCV, a non-lytic virus. So it replicates in cells and doesn't cause any harm. You see the following. The virus replicates, there's a T cell response, there's an ELISA response very early, as early as up here. But the neutralizing antibody response takes between 100 and 300 days. Well, that's a completely different game. And of course, it doesn't matter because that virus doesn't kill you in seven days. So it doesn't matter how long the antibody response takes. Even it doesn't matter whether you make any immune response. Because you remember, that virus is like the one I mentioned, jumps from a virus-carrying mother through the placenta to the unborn offspring, where there is no immune response but there is no damage and no immunopathology, so everybody's happy. Now, this is exactly the kinetics you see with hepatitis B. You see the T cell response, the ELISA response, and the neutralizing antibody response takes between 60 and 200 days. 
HIV is the same. T cell response, very early. The ELISA response, very early. But the neutralizing antibody response takes 100 to 300 days. Now, in our case, in the LCMV case in the mouse, we could get at least at some aspects of this interesting balance. We infected mice with this virus on day naught. You get certain virus replication, then it falls off and you can't measure it from blood. So you say, well, that's control. And this is mostly CD8 T cell protection. But then, you know, after maybe 100, 150 days, in some viruses, the virus pops up again. So it must have come from somewhere. You know, the virus is controlled, but it's not eliminated. And then in some others, nothing happens. And this is a bit like, you know, in, in the super controllers in HIV, you would have this, and in the others, you have more or less virulence. Now, of course, now you can study in this population here. Let's take open square mouse. You take the blood, you get the serum for antibody, and you get the virus for virology. And you do that for all these mice, and you find the following. The serum of open square mouse is not able to neutralize open square virus. Otherwise, of course, you know, it wouldn't be a virus carrier. So this is an open square serum escape LCME mutant. But this serum from open square mice neutralizes all the other isolates. We didn't find an example where such a serum couldn't neutralize. And the same is true for upright dark uh, triangle. That virus is not neutralized by the serum of that mouse, but it will be neutralized by the open square and so on. Now, the interesting population of scoffs is, of course, the, the elite controllers down here because they, you know, it's an inbred strain of mouse population. So some make it, some don't. And, it, of course, here you can't isolate virus, but you can take the serum. And the sera of these mice neutralize all these distinct isolates, including, of course, the original virus we put into the mice. So this indicates that antibodies are really, besides T cells, of course, the key to control long-term viremia. It's tested also in mice that can't make antibodies, there you can't get rid of the virus. So CD8 alone is not sufficient. You need both. And the con elite controllers simply make enough probably overlapping neutralizing antibodies with time so that there is no kinetic advantage for any mutant to actually you know, escape in that window. So overall, it's a delicate balance between an ongoing infection and an ongoing immune response. And in this case, it doesn't matter because the virus doesn't kill you anyway. So there is time, and there's time for this co-evolution again. Now, when you look at normal serum, and of course this can be done in so-called specific pathogen-free mice, or even sterile mice, like the colony in Wisconsin, you take the serum, just the normal serum, and test it against a, a, a rhabdovirus or against this persistently infecting LCMV virus. You find that against the rhabdotype or polio type or pox type virus, you always have a natural or a spontaneous antibody titer of about 1 in 20 to 1 in 30. And that reminds you of the fact that a serology lab 
virology or microbiology. What is the first action in a serology lab? First, we dilute the serum 1 in 30. Why? We don't want to see the background. Well, it's not background. We, it's highly specific. Because if you take that normal serum and absorb it with one serotype of a virus, then that 1 in 20 or 30 titer disappears to less than 1 in 2. But against the other, the alternate, no, alternative serotype, it's still 1 in 30. So it's, it's not background. It's highly specific, which indicates that these antibodies are within the national repertoire. And they are spat out just, you know, as a normal representation of, of the repertoire. And this was then tested by Adrian Oxenbein, who did most of these experiments in a second um, easy type of model situation. He took mice... UMT mice that can't make antibodies because they lack, you know, all, all B cells. And infected these mice with either LCMB, the virus we look at, or, or bacteria like Listeria, Listeria mon monocytogenes. It's a, antibody, uh, it's a bacterium that basically depends almost 100% from T cell mediated immune protection, like TB or leprosy and so on. And then he checked whether the, the mortality curves after infection were different in mice that had no antibodies versus mice that simply had a normal repertoire. And what he found was, yes, if you take a mouse that can't, has no antibodies and can't make antibodies, the LD50, the susceptibility, was shifted by a factor of 10,000. Here it's just shown for this raptor virus. You know, 10,000 is a lot. If then to such mice you simply add, again, a milliliter or one and a half of normal serum from a competent donor mouse that has never seen that bacterium, you give it back and survival curves are back to normal. So natural or spontaneous repertoire is extremely important for the initial phase of distribution and of course no surprise what it these natural or spontaneous antibodies determine is how much reaches organized lymphatic tissue that is spleen and, and lymph node versus what lands in kidney liver brain and of course these viruses shouldn't land in the brain because that's the end of the story particularly with these neurotropic viruses such as polio and visa. So there's a certain simplicity to, to the system, and I summarize here. You know, there is a repertoire, and that repertoire is represented by this spontaneous titer that is not actively induced and all the acute lethal infections are within that repertoire because if one isn't within that repertoire one is too efficiently killing the host and of course this must not be and the lcmv interestingly does not have this spontaneous titer it's less than one in two but there it doesn't matter because the virus is on non-cytopathic the IgM that you make very early in the response has only a 12-hour half-life. So even if you make an antibody response against self-components, it doesn't matter which. You know, with a half-life of, of 12 hours, you don't make an autoimmune disease. So IgM is largely, if not completely, T-independent for all infectious disease agents. And it is linked to this highly repetitive type of multima structure because there you don't need T help. And you don't need control of an IgM response because it's so short-lived. So it eliminates that. Now the switch to IgG, which is 20 days half-life, that's as our question. We can't do that. It's because of the multimeric antigen that makes the antigen completely T-independent, 
And the IgM response against these viruses is actually within two days. And that really reduces viremia and particularly reaching the brain. And that basically saves it. Um, Non-cytopathic agents, you know, of course, um, it doesn't matter. The spontaneous titer is less than one in two. But it doesn't matter. You can mature your, your antibody response by so-called affinity maturation, by somatic mutation. But if it takes 100 days or 300 days, really only has some impact on your immune complex disease which anyway takes many months. And of course, because of that, you don't have autoantibody disease because IgM is simply too shortly. Now, to make IgG, where the half-life is about 20 days, and because of the complement binding and all these issues, where you actually cause damage, there, the control is 150% via T-help. So if you don't have T-help, you don't switch to IgG, and therefore you don't make autoantibodies. And most of the time, it's the T-help that is the limiting factor in autoimmunity, and T-help usually is like being taken care of by negative deletion in the normal thymic deletional way. So, so far, so good. Now let's go to antigen localization. I've talked about specificity, about the complications, how to measure it, and what is relevant, and what may be less relevant. Now let's go to antigen localization. We take a tumor, which is a sarcoma tumor cell, that has never been passaged in vivo, so it hasn't undergone selection in, you know, because immunologists who want to do tumor immunology, of course, select the tumor in vivo for good rejection, because that gives you a short incubation time for the next paper. If that tumor kills your mouse, that's not a good target to do a, a, a immunology paper on tumor rejection. So in this case, these tumor cells get injected, and just for, you know, to, to, be, to e have a better measurement, we put, by, by, um, we put a viral gene into these tumor cells to, to introduce a very strong tumor-associated, tumor-specific antigen. And, I mean, we are simply-minded, you know, we, we use, of course, the same tools we have used to study antiviral antibodies or antiviral cytotoxic T cells. So we could use all the instruments. So in this case, you inject these single cells and you find there's no tumor. And you titrate that from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 8. With 10 to the 8, you get the tumor. So there is tumor potential, but, you know, under most circumstances, actually, the tumor doesn't grow. Now, you change the protocol and you take the same tumor cells, but now you don't inject them in a single uh, cell fashion, but in an aggregate. So you make a, a packed cube of tumor cells, like in a solid tumor, and you carefully transplant that via trocar subcutaneously. And you always get a tumor. Huh? It's the same number of tumor cells. Nothing has changed. It's the same strong tumor antigen. It's simply... You know, single cells versus packed cells. Well, the only correlate we could find was that in this case, within 24 hours, we found a few tumor cells in the draining lymph node. Whereas we couldn't find them here. Doesn't mean there are none, you know. But so, of course, the next experiment was to take a mouse, and on the left-hand side, you inject the single cells, and on the right-hand side, either on the same day or day before, five days before, you transplant this solid cube. What happens? In all cases, 
also the solid little cube of tumour was rejected. So that tells you the tumour cells themselves draining to the local lymph node actually can induce a cytotoxic T-cell response. Now, people, of course, didn't like that because dogma says only dendritic cells or macrophages or antigen-presenting cells with a personal dedication to bring antigen to the lymph node with all the second signals, danger and whatever they are called, you know, can induce a T-cell response. It's not true. It's simply not true. Fibroblasts, and we titrated it, you know, fibroblasts on the cell-for-cell -cell basis are as efficient in inducing a CTL response. Now, what is the difference? Well, a fibroblast normally doesn't have the privilege to migrate to the draining lymph node. It's only because we use a fair number of these. Like, we can't do it below 10 to the 3 fibroblasts. But about that 10 to the 3 fibroblasts into the footpath, we get induction of CTLs in the draining lymph node. So, don't believe everything that is published. I think that's... Now, let's translate that example to islet cells because they play a major role in um, diabetes, juvenile diabetes particularly. So, Pam Ohashi with Hans Hegartner put the, our favorite glycoprotein from LCMV under rat insulin promoter and expressed now and controlled that carefully, uh, found that this glycoprotein is expressed only in islet cells, as you would have hoped to find. So there's nothing in thymus and so on, but there is in islet cells. And now you can simply check, you know, what happens in these mice. Do they start to make an immune response and therefore are diabetes destroying the, the islet cells? Well, if you just wait and let the mice happily uh, age, nothing happens, no diabetes. But now we have the advantage of having a glycoprotein gene or glycoprotein expressed that is also the same in the virus that infects. And the virus always infects lymphatic organs, as I've shown you initially. So now you bring the bomb right into the lymphatic, in the secondary lymphatic, you induce immediately a fantastic CD8 response and you have diabetes within 8 to 10 days. All the ile is gone and your blood sugar is up. Interestingly, if you take a vaccine, your recombinant, where you have inserted the same gene, you know, and vaccinia is compared to LCMV like a, a, a Ferrari to a deux chevaux. You know, it's, it infects less cells, it's less kinetics, less extensive. You get induction of a CTL response, you can measure it, but it's not extensive enough to blow out all the, the transgenic islet cells. And we know that a diabetes only starts once about 90 or 95% of the islet cells are gone because the, the robustness of the system is usually, at least in biology, biology a factor of 10. So, we are not tolerant in the classical sense, but we don't recognize something that always is outside of lymph nodes and spleen and stays outside. But as soon as the same antigen is brought into a lymph node or a spleen, you know, the response goes off. So tolerance is a nice idea. Again, you know, peripheral tolerance is a very favored idea by many people. But in a sense, it doesn't exist. It's either the antigen is in the system, then you are non-reactive by deletion, or this, the antigen stays out of the system, and then you are non-reactive because you simply don't want to see that, or you ignore it. Now, people, of course, say, I ignore other facts, you know. But I think... This is so simple a concept and can be tested, for example, in tumor situations because basically you could look at islets as if it were a peripheral solid epithelial tumor. 
There's no difference. And in fact, if you look then at whatever you have to do to get rid of these islets versus to get rid of a solid peripheral tumor, what you have to do is of the similar magnitude. And the efficacy with which you induce an anti-solid peripheral tumor response is exactly the same with which you induce an autoimmunity of this type. So there's no, there no leeway. It always goes in parallel. And this is shown here. You see, we have these mice. We infect with LCMV. Within eight to ten days, everything goes. All the islets go. We take the vaccine, you're recombinant. There's no diabetes, but there are cytotoxic T cells and a little bit of immunopathology in these islets, of course. But now let's change the, the protocol. And this is, um, is um, um, an experiment, a series of experiments done by a veterinary um, postdoc, Ludovic. You take the relevant glycoprotein peptide against which the CTL response is made, and you continue to give that peptide over 30 or 50 days. Every two or three days, you know, you boost, you immunize steadily. Now what happens? You get a chronic diabetes that almost looks like juvenile diabetes. When you look at the islets, this time the islets are all already almost gone. But it's a completely different picture because now you see a sort of what we like to call a tertiary lymphatic structure that was constructed in the target organ, you know, which you find actually in rare cases of juvenile diabetes, but you certainly find it in Hashimoto's autoimmune disease or thyroiditis, or you find it in granulomatous um, lesions in chronic um, um, rheumato rheumatoid arthritis. So you have B cell areas and T helper cell areas, antibody. You know, it's, it's, it's like a, a new lymph node. So it's clear in this case, you didn't bring the antigen into the lymph node of the spleen. You brought the, an the lymph node into the antigen, which of course is not the usual thing an acute infection would do. But it's this reversal of the action that actually makes the outcome so definite because this tertiary structure will function and cause destruction until all the antigen is gone. And then, of course, the, the peripheral structure will simply dissolve. And if you look two years later, you won't find this tertiary lymphatic structure any longer. So it all depends not only on where you look, it also depends on when you look. And I think for all chronic processes, time is of essence. And um, so if the event is, let's say, on at age of 12 years or 6 years, but the disease outbreak is at 26, then of course you will not find the etiology of the reason. So this would need very careful and extensive um, epidemiology at its best. Now, with the tumors, of course, everybody would then like to argue, well, you know, there's something like cross-presentation. That is, the tumor is picked up by, by dendritic cells or macrophages, and they process it in such a way that the tumor antigen is actually reprocessed and put on the surface of these antigen-presenting cells in a peculiar way which is called cross-presentation. I don't want to go into the details, but it's a, a concept that is essential to all uh, tumor immunologies. Well, I would like to make the argument that while this is a nice idea again, it doesn't work. Here, we used an H2D biopsy mouse, and we took a fibroblast of that is completely histo-incompatible. And we put into that fibroblast a viral antigen via transfection. So you now have a tumor cell that expresses the wrong MHC, 
and a relevant tumor associated antigen. And if that idea of you know, picking up these antigens and processing them and re-expressing them correctly on the surface via class 1 MAC were correct, um, you, one would, could expect that in fact this stuff, this stuff is taken up and at the end of the day is presented in association with the host's own uh, class 1 transplantation antigen. Well, whatever happens, you cook it, you boil it, you irradiate it, you inject it 10 times, you do whatever you want, and as your readout, you take either cytotoxic activity against this nucleoprotein peptide presented in the context of the host, you don't find anything, you can measure protection in the host, nothing, so it doesn't work. But now you can use the same fibroblast with the same viral transgene, the same foreign MHC, but you add just one class 1 MHC antigen, L of D, because that's the one that presents the peptide correctly to in the BALP C H2D context. So now you titrate these cells it works like a charm. And you can titrate the difference. The difference is about 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 fold. So you never can say in biology it doesn't happen. But what you certainly can say, it's so inefficient as to be zero. Let me finish up with memory. Memory is defined as quicker and higher. You prime. You come back, this is just neutralizing antibodies, you see, it goes up, then down. This is the protective level. Then you boost, goes up quicker and higher. And you have, we have good vaccines against smallpox, polio, measles, many other things, but we don't against this, and we, we, I have made some arguments. Now, if you take a very simple experiment, not using sheep red blood cells or ovaldehyde, but simply an infection. You vaccinate the mouse with this rhabdovirus, and then you take the so-called memory T and B cells, simply the spleen, transfuse them to a recipient, and then challenge the recipient with the same virus, everybody dies. So whatever memory T and B you have transfused doesn't make a difference. However, if you take the serum from this donor and simply take the serum, transfuse it, and now challenge with the same virus, everybody survives. Now that experiment is of course the experiment we all have undergone in the last trimester of our fetus life. Because at, during that period, we received maternal antibodies via the placenta. In humans, this looks like this, you know. You have here, it's a hemochorial placenta. The mother side is just blood. The fetus side is a membrane. And there, there are FC receptors that pick up maternal IgG. And these are transported through this membrane and they fill the repertoire of the offspring. So, newborns have the whole gamut of immunological experience that the mother has accumulated until pregnancy. And you now immediately see the mother had to undergo and survive all childhood infections. Otherwise, she would not be able to have high enough titers of protective antibodies to hand down to the next generation. Whether you want to call that epigenetics or, you know, it's, it's in a way handing down of acquired capacities. Now, in cows, it's even more important 
important and you know there are many vets in, on, at least on the campus maybe not in here but calves have a very interesting um, this distinct mechanism they have a fully doubly membrane separation between fetus and mother so there's no transport system that can hook up and pick up IgG from the mother to transport so calves are basically without antibodies up till birth and that's why we all use fetal calf serum because we don't want these antibodies to to disturb our tissue calves and bind to stuff we don't want these antibodies to bind and that's the reason so they are born without antibodies no antibodies at all and they can't make antibodies but then they take the colostrum which is basically you know invented before Nestle, a concoctate and concentrate <laughs> of IgA and IgG, again representing all the repertoire the mother has acquired, and through the same type of FC receptors, these maternal IgGs now from the milk are picked up during the first 18 hours after birth in all these rumens, and that replenishes their repertoire and then they are home free. So two distinct mechanisms that use basically the same tools but anatomically different solutions. So mother a AB married to father CD will create a embryo AC. Now the mother had to be infected and immune and survive virus infection X and therefore she has anti X antibodies now the fetus is sort of shut off immunologically from the mother because the mother could of course react against the C component which it doesn't possess and this is guaranteed by simply having no MHC molecules on the surface of the separating um, membranes and the offspring of course should not react against uh, the unknown B quality so the offspring is kept immunoincompetent until birth no T cells response no B cell response so after birth the offspring has antibodies against X and of course under wild type situations not 2014 in Davis but you know 200 years ago, was immediately exposed to X, of course. Now, what happens is that the maternal antibodies, of course, protect the offspring against that infection. Well, after time, these maternal antibodies will dwindle. Half-life is 20 days, remember? So, later on, this infection will be not completely neutralized, but partially, and therefore there will be a partial infection, and therefore there will be active immunization and, you know, build up of an immune response in the recipient. Now, just think, if this baby is, you know, kept under quasi-sterile 2014 Davis or New York conditions, this doesn't happen, you know, this early exposure to all these infections so you wait 10 years before the first infection occurs then all the maternal antibodies are gone of course there will be no attenuation of an infection and therefore it will be a wild type type of like Ebola nowadays like exposure and this of course will be a cat catastrophe now polio has gone through exactly that kinetics you know polio was no problem or a little problem up till about 1950, 45. After the war, hygienic conditions, bathrooms, etc., improved vastly. Exposure to the first polio was delayed, delayed, delayed. And once it hit, let's say after five to seven years, you know, it became a wild type infection again. And that was the start of these uh, polio epidemics. So, in a way, it's very interesting. You know, things make sense. Antibodies are very important because they can be handed down from mother to offspring. Is another example why only mothers are really important. <laughs> you know. But it's also, you know, mothers teach the offspring 
what to do. Unfortunately, they also teach offspring not to get vaccinated. So, you know, it's not a one-way street, but the most important worldwide is certainly to educate girls to actually understand things. And it's up to us, teachers or researchers, to, you know, talk about these issues because they are very important. So, memory is a nice idea, but basically it's a laboratory artifact. You know, you can repeat the experiment beautifully. You can publish on memory in cell and nature, but protection is not, does not depend on memory. It only depends on sufficient neutralizing antibody titers at the time of infection, not four days later. Because to get so-called memory cells, you know, differentiated into plasma sites and then start producing antibody, takes four days. And that's too late. So, memory is not relevant to protection. Protection depends on the pre-infection neutralizing antibody sites, and for the T-cell side, it's activated T-cells. You see, that's why the TB granuloma is so important. I mean, I have a TB granuloma. It's very small. But it's the antigen, the, ba the bacilli in the TB granuloma that from time to time get drained to the draining lymph node and reboost the T cell response that then solidifies the granuloma that basically is responsible for the control of the granuloma. And it's only when that sort of ping pong game breaks down, like in HIV or, you know, old age or cytotoxic drug treatment that the whole thing explodes and becomes a catastrophe. But TB as such is not a health problem. It's only a health problem in association with malnutrition, you know, bad socio-economic situations, um, immunosuppression and so on. And that shows again that it's antigen stimulation that provides protect protection. It's not an idea like memory. So, it's antigen driven and there are several mechanisms wh where the antigen drives. It's either re-encountered, this is true for all mucosal types of infections, you know, respiratory tract, um, gastrointestinal tract, diarrheas and so on. It's often persistence, measles is a case, HBV, hepatitis B, C, HIV, you know, TB, leprosy, um, or in the host it can be antigen antibody complexes on follicular dendritic cells, which is a unique feature of the immune system that within these fo follicles I showed you, you know, there are specialized compartments where there are these follicular dendritic cells with Ig receptors that hook on to these immune complexes and basically in the center of the immune response keep a depot of the antigen. And this, nobody has exact measures, but probably lasts for two to four years. So you don't need an epidemic every year. You know, you have sort of a, a spread of the odds uh, in time. And then, of course, the medical consequence is we now vaccinate at three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months, the kids. We probably have to go on because the success of vaccine, vaccines actually has reduced the natural repertoire of re-exposure. So we should re-vaccinate at five years, 10 years, 15 years, particularly against, you know, young, young women because they have to keep up the tighter and prevent these funny whooping cough type of infections that we see now suddenly, you know, turning up, never seen before, where small babies at one month die of whooping cough. So revaccinations, of course, will be extremely important, and of course, education, but we know this is not very helpful. Um, <laughs> and of course, we have to look for anti, you know, for alternatives antivirals, antibiotics against TB, there's nothing else. Against, you know, um, leprosy, antibiotics, that's the only thing. 
against HIV-like or HCV-like. You can't make a vaccine. So the antivirals. And we have, I think, research has done beautifully. I mean, fantastically. Well, that's my general summary. Don't believe in dogmas. You know. Ideas are cheap. I think to change disease gives you a fairly good quality control. Evolution and co-evolution has time and needs time. Um, you should um, avoid misleading you know, promises like HIV vaccines were promised by the NIAID director three years after the outbreak 83 definition of the virus. You know, it's 2014 now. It's not around the corner. Um, also, with tumor vaccines, you know, leukemias and lymphomas, that's easy. It's within the immune system, easily accessible, no problem. Maybe melanomas, you know, developmental types of tumors always have smelled a little bit of immunology so they are also relatively easy but the, the nut to crack is is a peripheral solid carcinoma or sarcoma and I think there if we can manage that and I think from all of what I've said you know this may I cannot say impossible but it's not there um, we cannot beat evolution if you use the same tools. So it's useless to want to make neutralizing antibodies against HIV if HIV, you know, mutates away. And that is, of course, the evolutionary pressure that keeps the, the malaria or, or HIV. So there, of course, prevention, education, and antivirals, antibiotics. And this is for the youngsters, you know, we still know very little. So there's plenty of stuff to do. Um, and about half of what I've presented to you is probably wrong anyway, so, you know, plenty of room. <laughs> but I think wrong doubts and misleading hopes is much worse than not knowing. So we should be extremely careful not... Uh, not to promise things we can't deliver. Remember, the half-life of a politician is about four years. <laughs> we hope to have a longer half-life in science. But, you know, there are some politicians that make it several times for four years. And they may remember that we actually have promised certain things that we haven't delivered. And maybe that's one of the reasons why why there will be a squeeze on, on financing. So, and then of course don't miss the surprises because if you find something you have predicted, actually the outcome is boring, isn't it? Because you already knew. But you have, may have, one may have a chance of finding something unexpected and that of course is great. Now, I have to thank, you know, some of my teachers this is, this is my, my, my scientific genealogy. You know, some in Australia, some in, in uh, Switzerland, Germany, uh, this uh, in Lausanne, and this gives a con new concoctation. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, that's just how it is. And these are the people that was the last lab re reunion. I've worked with Hans Hengartner for the past 30 years, and we we sort of asked all the students and PhD students and postdocs and so on back to the lab three years ago just to, to close the lab, so to say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>